are you The audio good, Amber? Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, so welcome to the Data One Users Group. Um, I'm Andrew Sounds. I'm the, the chair of the Users Group right now. Um, and we have Chris Aker, uh, whoever, Chris, just wave. Uh, Chris is the vice chair. Um, you'll see both of us at various points throughout the, the uh, two days here. Um, so just as a, an immediate note, uh, this meeting is being uh, live broadcasts, uh, at least several of the plenary sessions are. So any comments or discussion that happened during that period will be part of that. Um, so just be aware of that as, as you're talking. Um, so uh, some initial housekeeping. If you don't know already, uh, the Wi-Fi network and password are uh, noted up here. Conference 2 is the network. Uh, Copper 2013 is the password. Uh, we will be 
tweeting using the hashtag uh, DUG2014. Um, and please use data1.org uh, as the handle if, if you are including anything. Uh, at data1 is, is apparently a, uh, a hip hop artist's uh, handle. So it's, it's a, a completely different discussion happen, happening there. Um, so just be aware of that and, and, uh, and follow along if, if you're into that. So uh, as an outline, um, these are some of the things we're going to cover kind of briefly here in the first uh, 20 minutes or so uh, before we dive into the more complete agenda. Um, all right. So a little bit of background, if, if this is your first DUG. Uh, the Data One Users Group uh, was established to try and foster engagement between Data One uh, teams, the core teams, and the user community. Uh, so we, we tend to have a pretty good mix of these types of groups. Um, at the DUG meetings. Uh, this, this is composed of lots of different people, uh, researchers, scientists, um, librarians is always a, a significant group, uh, government agency employees, policymakers, um, and then a number of, of different types of groups that we, we try and continue to include more of, um, but there's always more room for inclusivity here. Uh, one of the other major objectives here is uh, being a venue for dialogue and feedback around ongoing Data One activities. Um, so this is a place, this is the annual opportunity really for the community to, to come and talk with Data One uh, leaders about what's going on with Data One, what sort of things are happening, what you're interested in uh, seeing happen, um, and sort of have a, a dialogue about this. This is the fifth DUG meeting. Um, so if, if you aren't aware of this already, uh, Data One went through uh, an initial grant period um, with a, a series of DUG meetings, and we're now at a, a transitional period where phase two of data one is now beginning. Um, so one big question for this meeting is what might the DUG look like and what sort of role might it play in this phase two period of data one? Um, so that's one thing to, to be sure to keep track of uh, throughout the meeting. Um, so as a, another starting point, if, if you're new to Data One or, or to the DUG, I just want to make sure everybody knows who the executive team is for Data One. Um, we have Bill Mitchner, who's the PI. If, if you wouldn't mind just raising your hand or saying hello. Um, we have Rebecca Koskla, the executive director. Uh, Dave Vieglis, uh, director for Deve development operations. And Amber Budden, director of community engagement and outreach. Um, and everybody here who's on the Data One team or involved in the DUG, uh, or the steering group, we can all be approached at any point to ask any questions about what, what's happening or if you need to follow up at any point. Um, so please feel free to approach everyone. Uh, a little bit more on the core development team of Data One. Um, some additional people, some of whom are here and some who are not. I think some of whom may come throughout the meeting. Um, but basically it's, it's a broad, uh, broad group of, of different people from different types of institutions. Uh, so, at this point, I want to do a little bit of around the room. We need to be rather efficient in how we do this, um, so we're making it very brief. Uh, so what I'm going to ask everybody to do is say your name, your affiliation, uh, meaning what institutional organization you're with, your role there, if you're a scientist, a librarian, a, uh, a funder, whatever it is, and whether this is your first DUG or whether you're returning. Um, and we're going to do this rather quickly because we have a lot of people in the room and we need to get through it quickly. Um, so if you wouldn't mind starting, Chris. Be loud.
<laughs> I am Mark Sevilla. I am a University of Mexico and I work for the Washington Science Research Network, which offers the Mexican Network. Um, right now I have a member node hat and a long term research fellow hat. And uh, this is my second service in this capacity. My
Excellent. Thank you. All right. So uh, just a couple remaining things before um, before Bill comes up to talk about data one. Uh, so some things that we, we hope to accomplish during this meeting. Uh, we hope that you'll have an opportunity to learn about some new developments in data one, um, see some demonstrations of tools and services, engage with, with uh, leaders in the, the community and, and other community members, which is why we like to do introductions, um, and to help grow the data one and DUG community. So this is our fifth. We hope to have future ones. We hope to uh, explore other ways to, to do this. Um, so we very much value your feedback in that. Um, I'm sure that there are some other goals as well. So uh, please feel free to bring those things up to us uh, throughout the meeting. Um, some agenda highlights here. Uh, we have breakout sessions. If, if this isn't something that's already familiar to you, uh, we hope that you did receive an agenda, either in print or, or an email. Um, if you want a print copy, they're out at the desk. Uh, we have these breakout sessions. There are three breakouts. They're repeated. Uh, the idea here is that you can participate in two out of the three. Um, these are led by Data One core members uh, or core team members. Um, the rooms that we're using for these uh, are this room, the room next door, and a room downstairs. Uh, if you need help figuring out how to get to those, um, please ask at the desk. Uh, we have roundtable discussions as well. So the format for that is four roundtable discussions. Uh, split over two sessions, get to participate in two out of the four. Um, and these we have set up uh, that to be led jointly by Data One core team members and DUG members. Um, so there will be sort of two parts, uh, two points of perspective there. Uh, another sort of unique agenda highlight uh, is usability testing. Um, so there is a, some testing that's going to be done tomorrow on uh, the DMP tool. Um, the sign up for that is uh, listed up here. It's a bitly link DMP tool test, um, and uh, yeah, uh, that's what we're going to be doing. So we're, we'll be looking for, I think, 10 individuals, or what's the target number? 14 signups. OK. Uh, so we need 14 people to volunteer uh, to spend a, a few minutes um, talking about and, and giving some feedback on the DMP tool. That will be highly valuable. Uh, some remaining agenda highlights here. Uh, we are seeking opportunities for more member participation. Um, so this is something that's been a recurring theme in the past couple of years at the least. Uh, so we again have poster session and roundtables as part of the agenda. Uh, the poster session is tonight um, at 6 p.m. It's a reception and poster session. Um, I think we have 10 posters as part of that. Is that the right number? So we will have a number of posters at the poster session tonight. Um, so please come and uh, talk and mingle with everybody and, and see what's being presented. Um, you'll hear more about the second thing here in the afternoon during the business meeting, uh, but this is not an election year, but we are always seeking additional steering committee members. Um, so we'll talk a bit more about that. 
we just want to get this idea out there a bunch of times. This is an opportunity to, to help shape how the DUG works um, throughout the year, not just at the annual meeting. Um, so talk with me, talk with Chris, uh, with any of the steering committee team. Um, if, if anybody who's here in the steering committee, please raise your hand. Uh, I know Deborah and Bob and Sherry at the least. Okay. Uh, please talk with any of us or Amber um, to hear more or express your interest or whatever. We'll certainly be asking repeatedly throughout the, the two days. Um, and uh, just the last thing here, um, tomorrow afternoon on the schedule there is, uh, the entire afternoon is dedicated to a DMP tool workshop. Um, so if you're not familiar with the DMP tool, it's the data management planning tool. There's a new version that just came out a, a month or so ago. Um, so this is going to be an opportunity to see what the new features are, uh, start to use it, uh, give feedback on whether it works or doesn't work for your needs, um, and help guide where it might go in the future. Um, so that's tomorrow afternoon. Um, so at this point, uh, any urgent questions or comments before uh, Bill comes up to continue the conversation? Anything? Okay. Okay, wonderful. We're in good shape. You need to take this. Okay, thank you. So, welcome everyone to Copper Mountain. Uh, first of all, just a, a health warning here. We are at about 9,000 feet. So, those of you that are coming, how many of you are coming from sea level? Thereabouts? Okay. If you start feeling a little bit blurry headed, um, that's to be expected. If you feel like your alcohol is going a lot further, that's also to be expected. And the way to counteract that is drink lots of water. So please do that. What I'd like to do is a quick overview and update on data one. And I thought I would start off by just putting us into a historical context here. I'm not let's see if I've got a, oh, I do have a pointer. So <clears throat> here we are. We're concluding uh, the first phase of data one at 2014, getting ready to enter into phase two within the next three weeks. And I want to step back in time. So this person here, how many of you recognize him in the audience? A small, relatively small number of individuals. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> that is uh, Dan Atkins. He was uh, led the Blue Ruin Task Force for Cyber Infrastructure at NSF when he was there. And as a result of his efforts at NSF, they formed the Office of Cyber Infrastructure. Uh, and then that led to a whole slew of new programs, including the DataNet program, which we and uh, a number of other folks in the room here have benefited from being a part of. Uh, moving on to further up, 2004 was when NEON started the design effort. As you all know, uh, NEON is slated to become fully operational uh, 2017. Similarly, the Ocean Observatory Initiative Design started in 2007, and then full implementation is about 2015. The point being is that we are entering a new age of science where we've got lots of focus on these community collaborative observatories. And importantly, uh, these two efforts, uh, these are big dollar, big, uh, big equipment, big infrastructure projects, and they take a long time to develop and implement in the field. They will be providing massive amounts of data, which uh, clearly we all want to be able to take advantage of through uh, networks like Data One and others. Um, in 2008, uh, from the contextual standpoint, this is uh, when we started hearing about big data. Uh, this is Brian Heidorn. He was a program officer in NSF when he coined the phrase long tail uh, of science, long tail data, long tail uh, researchers. And then in 2011, the start of that was when we had the first uh, data management planning requirements at NSF. Um, the Open Government Initiative came about in roughly the start of 2013, end of 2012. Research Data Alliance, which some of you all go to, started in 2013. And then from the Data One perspective, we stand on the shoulder of some small giants anyway. Uh, 
this was a large information technology research program back in the late 2000s. Uh, the SEEK, Science Environment for Ecological Knowledge, was another ITR type project funded out of NSF. And there's several interoperability projects. And then the RFP for Data One for DataNet uh, came out in 2007, and then the award was actually made in 2009. So, uh, and this is where we've been the last five years that I'm going to provide an overview of, and then talk about the uh, future activities. So, <clears throat> we started with the recognition that we had some serious science challenges that we needed to face. Uh, one was um, clearly all the the massive amounts of data that are need to, needed to address these grand environmental challenges that we're facing and still continue to face. Things like climate change, energy issues, and so on. Um, <clears throat> a lot of you have seen a graph that I did back in 1997 with several of my colleagues in LTR at the time that showed data entropy, which was the loss of information over time. Uh, recently, uh, Tim Vines published a paper in um, current biology that showed uh, quantitatively that this information entropy is real in the biological uh, fields. And this is a really interesting paper if you get a chance to read it, but again it shows that over a period of 15, 20 years you're losing roughly half of the information uh, available. Similarly, uh, we've done some work within Data One to try and understand the community, and this was a paper published by Carol Tenniper, uh, Mike Frame, and others um, in PLOS One, and it looked at um, data sharing perceptions by environmental scientists. And importantly, uh, at the time this was done, you can see that um, most scientists used no metadata standards or they used something that they ginned up in their own laboratory, and very few of them actually used international or national data standards for, for documenting their data. And then lastly, this is, um, I think, indicative of uh, one of the key challenges we wanted to address in Data One as well, which was the fact that if you want to try and discover environmental data, it really is like looking at the uh, uh, London skyline back during the Industrial Revolution and that you don't know where to go. You know, there are literally hundreds and thousands of repositories out there where which one has the data that I need. So that points to the need for a project like Data One to federate across all these repositories and facilitate uh, data discovery. So that was our, our mission was um, initially, and we've stuck with it, is to provide universal access to data about life on Earth and the environment that sustains it. This has continued to broaden out over time, encompassing not only biological, physical type data, but also we've in more recently been adding in lots of uh, lots more human social science type data as well. Um, <clears throat> we've focused on meeting our mission through three key activities. One is building community. That's part of what the Data One Users Group is all about. Uh, in addition, developing sustainable data discovery and interoperability solutions, and then third, enabling science through a set of tools, and I'll go into more detail about all of these. So I want to highlight some, so what I think are the real key successes of Data One in the, its first five years, and then I'll switch over and talk about our next five years uh, shortly thereafter. So first and foremost, I think one of the things that really distinguishes us as a project from most of the other cyber infrastructure projects that had previously been funded at NSF. Uh, that's not to say that the other newer data nets are also, I think, following the same uh, mold in terms of helping to build community. But prior to uh, the funding of Data One, there was little emphasis on actually building you know, the community to better take advantage of tools and so on. And we've really worked hard to try and do that. Uh, we've done that through a variety of means. Uh, the first is, this is from our all, one of our all hands meetings early on. Uh, we actively engage lots of individuals from the community and working groups. Uh, the first phase of the project, we had roughly 10 working groups plus a number of other workshops. We brought in individuals to tackle some key questions that we had with respect to either cyber infrastructure development or education best practices and so on and so forth. Um, secondly, 
we've focused a lot on providing access to uh, best practices as well as some uh, curricula uh, materials through our website. And these have been extensively used for uh, lots of faculty members go to the Data One website. They download a lot of our lectures and PowerPoint presentations and then incorporate those into their introductory ecology and environmental science classes where they can talk about you know, how to best manage your data and so on. And that's uh, incredibly valuable. We've had uh, one of our, you can't see this, but this is the best practices primer. And it's also available through our education resources. And this is the best practices database. But the best practices primer is like a 10-page document that's been downloaded um, hundreds and hundreds of times and used, again, for uh, classes and other uh, groups. The other thing we've done is build a, um, a tools database. Um, oops, sorry, it doesn't show up here, but we have a tools database as well, which helps you identify tools, let's say for entering metadata that you may not be aware of, visualization tools, and so on. We do lots of, uh, we've done lots of hands-on training, uh, albeit this is a rather difficult way to reach a huge audience because you're doing lots of one-on-one, -on -one, but nevertheless, it's been an invaluable part of our last five years. And then importantly, and we've been working with a number of uh, groups, the other data nets that uh, are all represented here, uh, as well as lots of international bodies as well that are trying to tackle similar questions related to data sharing and uh, trying to improve science through new informatics tools. So <clears throat> I think another real hallmark of Data One has been the working group model. And we adopted this from uh, a number of the synthesis centers that have been in existence, in particular the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, which had been in operation, has been in operation for roughly 18 years, Masa Manos. Um, <clears throat> the working group model is geared towards bringing in uh, anywhere from an eight to um, 16 or 18 individuals to intensively focus on a topic for three to five days. And this has been really the foundation of a lot of our cyber infrastructure development as well as our education and outreach work in Data One. And I'll show you some examples of all the working group activities shortly. Uh, but this is what two of them looks like. This is uh, one of the things we learned as well is we need lots of interactions amongst our working groups. So this is the usability and assessment and socio-cultural working groups uh, intermingling with one another. Um, we do lots of facilitated um, working group meetings and so on. And it's been, again, uh, led to a large number of publications, a large number of tools, a large number of uh, practices and procedures that we've adopted in Data One. So, again, the uh, one of the working groups that we working groups is uh, working workshops that we did, not as opposed to a working group, it focused on uh, best practices, and we did two of these over the last five years, and we brought in roughly 40 individuals. And we developed from that 65 or so best practices, as well as a couple hundred software tools. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can discover these through the uh, resources on the Data One website. So the whole idea here, which I think has really caught a lot of traction, is that with respect to both the tools and the best practices, most researchers and most students you know, when you when they confront a problem, let's say how to enter metadata or what standard did I use or, um, you know, any number of questions that arise, you know, if, if I'm an informatics person, you know, my, my, my initial response is to hit them with as much information as I possibly can. You know, give them that 20-page technical document, tell them to read through it and so on. And that's the last thing in the world, quite frankly, that they want to do is read a 20-page technical document in order to answer what they think is a simple question. So we try to take our knowledge that these 40-some individuals had and condense it down into a one-pager. And that's what this represents here. So this is a, a question that you might um, come across with respect to metadata. Here's the best practice. Here's the rationale for that. 
here's some additional information and here's some examples. And in a lot of cases, the additional information includes pointers to, let's say, YouTube videos or uh, training materials so they can go and get a quick uh, update or more information on that particular topic. But the idea is, again, to try and answer that question within a one-page uh, uh, document to the extent possible. The other thing that <clears throat> we've done that I think is was relatively unique at the time, I think uh, other projects are starting to uh, incorporate usability testing into the mix now. <clears throat> but at the time, it was relatively unique. Um, most uh, cyber infrastructure projects at NSF were put in strictly to do research. And it was to develop some kind of prototype tool or service that may or may not, quite frankly, ever see the light of day. It may never be used by anybody, but the fact you can do the research, you can create a tool or solve a problem. Uh, again, whether or not it's actually deployed and put into production and so on, really didn't necessarily come into the equation. But more recently, uh, the last decade or so, uh, that has been the case. There's been a lot of intention in towards, you know, what are your products? Not only should you be producing publications, but your infrastructure should be used by the community. <clears throat> and what's been forgotten is that in order to do that, you need to make your software as usable as possible. And that's where we've done a lot of usability testing as part of Data One, through our all hands meetings, through the Data One users group meetings, and then specifically through lots of uh, small focus group and other uh, related activities. And this has greatly improved the uh, look and feel of our website as well as the various tools that we uh, and services that we provide through Data One. Okay, the working groups have been focused on several different activities. I'll show the community engagement side of it first. Um, let's see, in the upper left, uh, we get towards education, so we've created a lot of tutorials uh, with respect to data management. These are all available through the website. We've done lots of training as well. Uh, the usability and assessment uh, has been geared towards, again, focusing on usability of software tools and services, as well as doing surveys of the community to understand uh, current practices and needs uh, that the community of researchers and others have. Uh, Sociocultural was really geared towards understanding the community uh, at large, and there's been a lot of interaction between those two working groups, as I showed on the, one of the previous slides. Uh, sustainability and governance has been a, a big focus over the last five years, and will be an increasing focus over the next five years. And then we had two additional um, working groups that uh, came into effect um, uh, this one came into effect more recently. This was not part of our initial proposal. This is uh, exploration, visualization, and analysis. And this was initially led by Bob Cook from Oak Ridge National Lab and Steve Kelling at uh, Cornell. And this particular visual here demonstrates some of the work that was done with eBird data that led to two State of the Birds reports that were released by the President over the last five years. The um, Last one has been public participation in scientific research, otherwise known as citizen science. And <clears throat> Data One was really instrumental in bringing this community together. Uh, we held the first uh, international meeting on citizen science. That was in 2012, August 4th through 5th. Uh, we're holding our next meeting in February. This will be the second international meeting of the uh, what's now called the citizen science or organization, uh, I'm sorry, Citizen Science Association. And in addition, we've helped develop that, uh, that new association. So it's uh, coming into existence now. We've got a final meeting late July, and this, the Citizen Science Association has been effectively uh, announced to the broad community. And we're going through the process of setting up a 501c3 that will take place over the next six months or so. Uh, but this has gotten garnered uh, incredible worldwide support. It's been f featured on uh, NPR, New York Times, lots of other venues. So we've had some real impact on citizen science in the U.S. and internationally. 
The um, <coughs> Data One Uses Group has been, again, a great way to interact with all of you to understand the needs of data repositories and scientists and educators. Uh, we had our first meeting in 2010 and have held them every year since then, so we're up to our fifth one. And uh, the growth trajectory has been right on target. So we've just hit over 200 uh, members of the users group. And again, these are repositories, university libraries, uh, some individual educators and others that are all part of this. And we uh, are glad that you all could make it here to Copper Mountain. The, um, <clears throat> from the cyber infrastructure perspective, again, we also had working groups. Uh, one major activity there was what we call the core cyber infrastructure team uh, that was a, a group of uh, individuals, some of whom are representing the audience here, that focused on the overall design of the day one architecture. And that group is, was just phenomenal uh, activities over the first three years that led to the production release uh, of data one at the end of year three. Uh, <clears throat> we have a variety of different uh, working groups that show up here. Uh, we had a metadata working group. We had a, a couple workshops that we focused strictly on security issues, uh, authenticated sign-on and various security aspects of the project. Um, let's see. The EVA was one that crossed um, both the community engagement as well as the cyber infrastructure side. Uh, so we had a lot of our developers that participated in these EVA meetings uh, to, again, create that software that could enable things like the State of the Birds report to uh, be produced. Uh, similarly, usability and assessment was another one that crossed uh, both uh, domains of Data One as well. And then we had others that focused on the ones in the middle, focused on metadata, uh, provenance, and then semantic uh, mediation as well, semantic tools, uh, of which we have built upon those and uh, will be incorporating some production level uh, support into the new uh, phase of Data One. So, <clears throat> so stepping back in time, uh, again, the Data One infrastructure, for those of you that are new to this, uh, we have three major components. One is the coordinating nodes. Uh, we have three in the U.S. currently. These are located at the University of New Mexico, uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Oak Ridge National Lab, and uh, University of Tennessee, which we call the Oak Ridge Campus, University of New Mexico, and then UC Santa Barbara. And this is really the under the hood part of Data One. This is where all of the replication, the network-wide services take place, the indexing of the metadata catalogs, all this takes place at the uh, coordinating nodes. And the reason we have three is in case one of them goes down, uh, the other two can pick up the slack and provide 24-7 access to all the Data One resources. Uh, the real foundation, though, of Data One, which is a federation, are, in fact, the member nodes, which many of you are all representing here. So this is where the actual data are stored. Uh, what we do is we ask the member nodes to share their metadata catalog and then we do the indexing and so on. Then we provide additional other services for the member nodes as well, some of which are taken advantage of and some of which are not. But this includes things like replication services. So if you, if you have a small member node and you want to archive your data at another location, uh, other member nodes can provide space as well as through the coordinating nodes we can provide additional space as well so that your holdings can be replicated and uh, preserved, protected for the long term. And then lastly, um, another key part of the day one infrastructure is what we call the investigator toolkit. And we'll talk more about the member nodes and the toolkit uh, as part of the breakout sessions for today uh, in particular. So what we focused on is uh, creating tools that make it possible to tie into the Data One infrastructure to the extent possible. Um, tools like um, 1R, for example, is a plug-in that you can use to connect up your R analyses directly with data that are part of Data One infrastructure. Some of these are more or less standalone. Um, uh, packages like uh, DMP tool uh, here, 
which is indicated. This is a more or less a standalone package that's not tightly coupled with the data one uh, infrastructure. Um, so in total, then we try and cover some elements of the entire data lifecycle to the extent possible. So uh, from planning, the DMP tool, collection, data up is another project we've been working on. This is getting ready to go through a, a expansion into supporting a whole array of different types of spreadsheets, Google spreadsheets and others. It'll be uh, an open source uh, tool that's being created. Uh, we'll probably undergo a name change to reflect that, uh, which we tend to think will be called Dash. Uh, assurance through, let's say, 1R. Data description through some of the tools there. This is uh, Morpho for uh, creating ecological metadata language, data. Uh, data, what it does is it takes Excel spreadsheets and it helps you create uh, preservation-ready data products by cleaning up the spreadsheets, getting rid of a lot of the errors that are commonly part of spreadsheets, as well as adding in metadata so that those spreadsheets can be understood by others uh, over the long term. Uh, preservation is through OneShare, which is a repository for uh, spreadsheet data, as well as the coordinate nodes and member nodes. Uh, discovery through our search interface, plus Zotero and Mendeley. Uh, integration through a couple products, 1R as well as OneDrive, and then analysis and visualization through a couple of tools that are commonly used right now uh, by the scientific community, Kepler, which is an uh, analytical workflow solution, and then VizTrails, which is uh, for visualization uh, data. It's a workflow solution as well. So where are we right now? Uh, these are data one by the numbers we have. Over 20,000 individual users, uh, 34 member nodes, 21 are presently in production. Uh, one is undergoing testing, it'll be released very soon. And then 12 are in various aspects of the pipeline to becoming member nodes, and you'll hear more about that as part of the uh, breakout sessions that we uh, go into this afternoon. Uh, we're nearing a half million objects with uh, many more tens to hundreds of thousands of objects in the, the next uh, dozen or so uh, member nodes that are in the pipeline. 13 tools that we've released. And then uh, a large and diverse community, I think. Uh, we've partnered with 55, some other projects, uh, over 300 other collaborators, 205 individuals in the Data One Users group. And then those one-on-one -on -one hands-on training activities, we've done 80, some of those at uh, national and international societies um, in the U.S. and worldwide. So one of the real successes, though, is our infrastructure has been stable, robust, and reliable. We've had 0% downtime, uh, despite uh, having survived a number of hacks, a number of... Uh, uh, the heart bleed bug and so on. And then this was uh, uh, an unfortunate incident. This was a helicopter that crashed at the University of New Mexico that uh, brought down our <coughs> server operations for half a day in order to remove the helicopter from uh, the roof of the UNM hospital. Uh, you can see all the power lines right there. So we were down for a short period of time there, but the other coordinating nodes kicked in as they were supposed to and took over, so we had zero downtime. So where are we going? In the next few minutes, I'll do a quick run through on that to give you a sense of our phase two activities. And we are continuing to address challenges that uh, the community faces as well as all of you have uh, pointed out to us as being high priority activities for the next five years. Uh, <clears throat> One is a back to the history diagram. Again, the whole issue with respect to big data came out after we submitted the data one proposal. Uh, no one was even thinking or talking about big data at the time. So that's a whole new effort that requires some special uh, uh, work on the part of data one and all. We'll give you some hints as to what that is in the next few minutes. Uh, open science is another new buzzword that really came into being over just the last few years. Uh, the open government initiative, again, focusing on open science and access to data produced uh, as part of governmental grants and agency work. 
And then uh, the long tail, um, uh, <clears throat> the long tail discussion by Brian Hydorn, uh, pointing to the fact that you know it's it's the small projects, the indiv individual investigators, the small college universities that really uh, are out here on this end, sort of hanging alone. And I know Jim Meyer and Seed is also very interested in supporting the long tail uh, scientists and so on. Uh, that don't have repositories or places they can normally go to on a ready basis. Uh, others, specialized repositories like GenBank, Protein Data Bank, and others have been community-based repositories have been there for a long, long time, and the community is uh, built up around those. So our vision is to support the entire life cycle, and we've been focusing um, in early on in providing access uh, discovery and access for data. So this is one part of the workflow, data acquisition. Uh, so you, again, you want to be able to discover data that come from a variety of different sources, uh, field-based sensors, and so on. Uh, you want to be able to run it through quality assurance, uh, metadata and semantics, and then be able to deposit data back into uh, repository space. Uh, but in addition to that, we have discovery and access. We have integrated uh, from the data analysis side of things, we have integrate and transform, uh, analyze, modeling, and visualization, and then ultimately publication and citation of the data, and then having the data, again, feedback into the repository federation. So our next five years are going to focus on four key elements. One is semantically enabled uh, data discovery. A second one are data services uh, providing a registry for data services that, again, support things like the big data problem. So in this case, you can see MODIS. Uh, many scientists can't download terabytes and terabytes of MODIS data, so there are solutions out there that enable them to download subsets of MODIS data. So we'll be able to uh, advertise those services, provide access to them through Data One, that will, again, support things like data extraction and subsetting, that allows scientists to work with big data sets at their own desktop without having to run uh, analyses elsewhere. Provenance is another one that is really key and as part of reproducibility and open science, it's increasingly important to be able to show that the data can be reproduced. So if you run data through <clears throat> a particular workflow, again, you'll get the same results as someone else that does the same thing. Importantly, though, provenance is one way to also help discover data. So you can look at a particular set of analyses, look at the analyses and say, okay, wow, you know, this is like right up my alley. This is what I'm interested in. Where did the data come from? So it's also another way to discover data as well as back through the provenance. And then education and outreach is going to be much more of a focus on um, web-based uh, uh, education programs, which uh, we'll have a lot of discussion about as part of the breakout sessions here as well. So our goal is to have a significant impact on the community. We're focusing on three groups in particular. Um, this is Steve Ombach. He was with uh, he was formerly with Neon. He's now with the U.S. Global Change Research Program. And one of the questions he asked me back in December when I met with him is, he said, you know, as part of my USGCRP responsibilities, I'm still trying and having difficulty discovering and accessing the data that we need uh, for synthesis and policy making and so on. So again, we're uh, focusing on meeting the needs of he and other scientists that are, again, trying to engage in that synthesis and decision making work. Uh, Kara Wu is a uh, uh, a postdoctoral uh, researcher at Washington State University, and she's interested in, one, managing data from the Lake Baikal project that's funded by NSF, 50-some years worth of data, as well as being able to make sure that things are reproducible uh, that she does there as well. So she's interested in that, plus the entire data lifecycle aspects. Uh, Carly Strasser is a librarian with the California Digital Library, and she's very interested in teaching uh, researchers there at the University of California system universities how better to manage their data. So these are the three 
uh, I would argue, three most important uh, constituencies for Data One: researchers, uh, young and old, uh, various levels of skills, as well as data librarians and others that are trying to provide tools and services to help meet the needs of their faculty and students. So I'm going to briefly look at project management. Um, we're organized somewhat similar as we have been the past few years. We report to NSF clearly and we have interactions with lots of our partners. Uh, we have a, uh, a dynamite external advisory board that we work with and then two real key components of the project. One is the uh, cyber infrastructure side. This is run by Dave Viglaeus. Uh, and then Amber Budden, who does the uh, community engagement and outreach. And they oversee the four working groups, which I'm going to talk about over the next couple of slides here. Uh, we have uh, the senior leadership, again, was uh, pointed out by uh, Andrew previously. But more importantly, we have a leadership team that, <clears throat> that is quite diverse, that includes a number of individuals in this room and outside of this room that uh, cover all elements of, of Data One. So uh, some of these folks have, we've been working with for years. Others are all new to the mix, like Deborah McGinnis from uh, RPI is a relatively new individual for us, uh, and Mark Schildauer as well from the University of California, Santa Barbara, for example. So now a little bit more about the working groups. The four key working groups are CI. Uh, this is led by Dave and uh, Matt Jones, who is not here. Uh, and again, they'll be focusing on those four key uh, elements of cyber infrastructure that I mentioned, provenance, semantics, discovery, uh, data services, as well as uh, creating a number of extensions that allow it, make it possible to bring in whole new classes of, of member node architectures into Data One very easily and transparently. The Community Engagement and Outreach Working Group is led by Viv, who is here, uh, as well as Carly Strasser. And we're going to, again, be focusing much more on the web-based uh, web education for this so we can reach a much broader audience. We'll still do some um, periodic training, one-on-one, -on -one, hands-on training at uh, meetings and so on. But we're going to really start up a, a web-based seminar series and training that way. Uh, third is usability and assessment, and we have Mike Frame here, uh, as well as Carol Tenniper. Uh, and then we heard uh, a bit about the uh, usability testing that will be taking place here with respect to the data management planning tool. I encourage you to sign up for that. It's actually a lot of fun in addition to uh, helping out the project. And then lastly, Sustainability and Governance Working Group is led by myself and Patricia Cruz with the University of California Office of the President. And we're going to be focusing on uh, developing the sustainability framework for the uh, years 11 and beyond for Data One. So at the end of phase two, um, I think we'll be looking at a, a pretty significant decade of achievement that, again, will be meeting the needs of building the community, uh, providing that stable cyber infrastructure, and then as well as the new tools and services that we are developing to meet your specific needs. And without further ado, I'll thank all of those individuals and universities and collaborators that have been part of Data One, and then uh, say a big thanks to all of you uh, as well. So I think I used up my time, but be around if there are any questions, and then we'll certainly go into a lot more detail as part of all the breakouts over the next uh, day and a half as well. So thank you. Um, now we're going into member nodes, the overview, and the lightning talks. Uh, the meat of it is the lightning talks. So we'll briefly do an overview of member nodes and how they fit in. Of course, Bill already covered a lot of it. Thank you. <laughs> um, the plan is have a brief overview, and these are the member nodes or prospective member nodes who are going to be telling us a little bit about um, their uh, repository and how they work with Data One. That looks familiar. I'm so glad you did that. <laughs> there are um, three main components of Data One. 
we have coordinating nodes, member nodes, and the integrated in investigators toolkit. Um, the coordinating nodes keep track of uh, metadata, provide indexing services, and this is where the meat is, in my opinion. And we have the investigators toolkit. Where member nodes fit into um, all of data one is you hold the data, the member nodes own the data, they curate the data, they um, archive it. Data one provides services in um, reporting, discoverability, and I hate to read these, so I won't. <laughs> That the pointer? Yeah. I think this is a really cool chart because it really shows how the member nodes and the coordinating nodes and the toolkit all fit together. Okay, this I think is really interesting. At the DUG last year, we had 11 production member nodes plus the three replication nodes. Um, at that time, we had 15 near term candidates and Dryad is now a member node, so is EDAC, and so is SEED. NKN is nearly there. Today, we have 18 production member nodes with the three replication nodes. Um, so in the last year, we've added seven, and these guys are in the pipeline. Now, here's the meat. Chris will start off with KMB and tell us a little bit about the Gulf of Alaska, too, and we'll go down the list. If you have any questions, uh, if it's a brief question about a member node, ask it then. Otherwise, we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. Chris? Okay, so I guess I'll start out with... Uh, uh, the KMB, the Knowledge Network for Biocomplexity. So the KMB started out as a National Science Foundation uh, uh, grant, and it involved uh, the National Center for Ecological, Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, um, the Long-Term Ecological Research Network at the University of New Mexico, Texas Tech, and uh, the San Diego, San Diego Supercomputer Center. Um, ultimately, the KMB is you know, one of those long tail type of um, repositories. Um, it's free for researchers, uh, individual researchers or labs to uh, contribute data to. It provides long-term storage for, uh, for uh, ecological environmental data sets. Um, the, one of the features of it is that it does support private uh, data. So you can, as you add data in, um, you can add access control and share it within just a, uh, a smaller group or a lab at first and then make it public uh, over time. Um, it supports strong revisioning so um, uh, so that basically every object that goes into the repository uh, is kept over over time. And so any any citation of uh, an individual data object, a, a data file or a metadata file is uh, will will be there um, for long term. Um, recently, we've added in support to publish uh, via a DOI, so any data, uh, any data set can can be uh, uh, tagged with a DOI and and made public and and citable. And it's powered by software that's written at uh, NCs and has you know from these other institutions uh, called Metacat, and we can talk about that. But Metacat is a um, uh, piece of software that implements the Data One API that you just saw. As far as metrics go, there are a little over 20,000 uh, uh, metadata documents in the KNB that describe 19,000 or so data objects. Underlying that are actually 138,000 actual objects, and th that includes all of those revisions behind the publicly available, you know, uh, um, most recent versions. And just to give you an idea of the, um, the diversity of data that are in the repository, there's about, I, I counted up about 5,500 uh, unique keywords that people had put into their, their metadata, you know, 
put a I put a, a list of um, you know just uh, some some examples here. So there's a, a broad range of, of data provided by the the KNB, and there's over 600 um, contributors to the KNB network. So as far as our partnership with Data One goes. Um, the KNB was a founding member, or founding member node with, within Data One, and uh, helped develop the the, the programming interface um, for Data One. And so this, and, and also some of the tools that work with uh, with Data One. So it's we're focused on the the Data One API as the way to move forward for the the KNB um, repository. And this this uh, uh, is a Example of um, a web interface that we've been working on for searching uh, the MetaCat repository, the the KMB repository, and uh, and so this is this uses the the Data One API. So I'll move on to the Gulf of Alaska data portal. Um, this I'm just sitting in for Molly McCammon. Uh, um, so. This this repository is one of the newest uh, within Data One. Um, it's part of the Alaska Ocean Observing System and Gulf Watch Alaska, which it's it's basically a regional archive that provides uh, data on that on the south coast of um, of Alaska, and it's a, a partnership between government agencies like NOAA and and others. Uh, academic institutions like the University of Alaska Fairbanks, um, industry, um, Shell Corporation, and other NGOs that that are all focused on on largely in for for this particular um, uh, group is the um, the oil impacted areas due to the the Exxon um, Valdez oil spill, and this is an example of uh, some uh, salinity data that they provide. So again, metrics, they're, um, they're just getting going in the last couple of years for pushing data into Data One, 95 uh, metadata files and over 400 uh, data files. And their data spans the, you know, basically the century. Um, you know, the benefits to Data One is that this is a, a, a tier one, or sorry, a tier three data um, member node. So it's implementing, uh, implemented by MetaCat. Or they're they're using MetaCat as their their backend uh, database. Um, so this is one of the only comprehensive data archives for the south coast of Alaska, and uh, and the only real long-term monitoring of um, this this highly significant oil spill. Um, for for GOA, you know, they replicate content from their member node to other member nodes like the KNB. So they they benefit. Um, by you know utilizing the, the the data one network, and uh, and they'll be using the the metrics provided by data one to report back to their their agencies. So I'll end there, and the next one is uh, PP Bio. Hi everyone, it's an honor for me to be here talking about the PPBio program and it's the Brazilian program for biodiversity research. Uh, we say PPBio in Portuguese, but some people say PPBio in, in English. And it's a federal program uh, on biodiversity research. It started 10 years ago in the Amazonian region. So we, we are talking about the Western Amazon region, and the goal of the PPBio program is to advance knowledge on biodiversity in the Amazon, in, in Brazil. And so it's been expanding to the other regions as well, and it's much focused on building human resources uh, capacity to conduct research, also on building field infrastructure and on uh, preserving and sharing data. So the, the dots here represent the, the field sites that we have. We have uh, long-term field sites, and it differs a little in the size. 
That's why some are yellow and other are uh, red. Uh, historically, in the Amazon region, most of the uh, human resources on uh, uh, research on ecolo ecolo ecological research. It's uh, concentrated in the Manaus region where the National Institute of uh, Amazonian Research is, the IMPA, and on Belém where the Geodi Museum is focused. So one of the goals of PPB is also on expanding and uh, building capacity in the regional um, institutions and that's also something that has be, been very successful over the last 10 years. And we have a MetaCat instance at IMPA where we hold our data and uh, researchers uh, follow a data policy to make data available. So we have been growing our um, data packages, quantities uh, all through the years. So we have now about 100, 400 data packages and uh, 300 of them are with the data tables also uh, available. So here uh, we show the, where the access to our data come from and we believe that our partnership with Data One will expand the, the red dots and exposing our data to a, a wider audience so that could facilitate partnerships. And uh, we hold a unique long tail data that's very hard to and costly to get so uh, building field uh, infrastructure and getting the data and we have uh, a data curation uh, procedures that the go back and forth between the researchers and the uh, data curators two or three times before they the data is entered to the repository so it's a highly uh, curated data that we hold and we uh, also use a lot of the data one um, uh, materials for uh, training, so that's also something to add about our partnerships. And as a successful program in Brazil, uh, other institutions may uh, uh, call us to talk about our experience, and we believe uh, our uh, becoming a member node might be something that could. Uh, encourage other groups to also become part of the network. Thanks. So. All right, uh, I'm with the Terra Populous Project, one of the other DataNet projects. And the TerraPop project is part of the Minnesota Population Center, which has been for 20 odd years uh, integrating and disseminating census and survey data, uh, especially microdata. So that's the individual and household records from censuses in the US and around the world. And we do a lot of work doing harmonization of that data across time and place so that you can have comparability from one census to another, uh, whether that's over time or from one country to another. Uh, along with that, we also build data access systems that have fairly sophisticated subsetting and transformation functionality so that you can get into these very large data sets and get the data that you need for your particular research question. TerraPop is a relatively new project at the MPC, and we're focusing on integrating all of this population census and survey data. Now we're adding environmental data into the mix. Uh, just a little bit about how much data we deal with and how much uh, gets out to the researching public. Uh, IMPUMP is international, one of our big microdata projects that holds census records uh, from around the world. So we have 74 countries, 238 censuses, and over 500 million person records as part of that project. 
Uh, we have 9,000 plus users from around the world that get access to that data and that includes a lot of researchers as well as a lot of the statistical agencies that have given us their data actually come back and access their data again through our systems because they're easier than whatever they've been able to do uh, within in-house um, if they have anything. And we had over 9,000 extracts last year. Uh, NHGIS, which is our US aggregate census project, uh, so that includes GIS boundary files and all of the aggregate census tables dating back to 1790. Um, we've got over 22,000 tables there, over 300 billion cells in those tables, and almost 800 shapefiles that go along with that. Uh, again, 11,000 plus users, almost 30,000 extracts. So we're out there in the social science community primarily um, is where a lot of those researchers are coming from. And both the, these projects, IPMS International and NHGIS, are being folded into Terrapop to some degree. Uh, IPMS International will have almost that entire collection, NHGIS we're doing a little bit more selection from that collection of what gets into the Terrapop system. Uh, in our partnership with Data One, one of the big benefits that we see is exposure to a broader audience of researchers. So getting beyond the social sciences to environmental and ecological science researchers who are also interested in this human population data. Um, but getting our resource into their hands. Um, we're also, as part of the DataNet projects, we have an incentive to be interoperable with all the other DataNet partners. Uh, and some of the things that we're thinking about as we go forward with our work with Data One, um, we've been working on the generic member node implementation of our member node and a new version of that, so we've helped get a lot of the bugs out of there. Um, we also have the DDI metadata standard is our kind of go-to standard for all of our data, which is something that Data One hasn't worked with before, so we're kind of working on getting that integrated into Data One a little bit more. And looking forward, because of our expertise in this kind of data subsetting, um, we're planning to work with Data One as they get into that functionality a little bit more. And we will have a poster at the poster session this evening if you're interested in learning more about the Terrapod project specifically. So I focus more on the MPC here. So I'm representing that Gleon member node, which is the Global, Ecological, Global Lakes Ecological Observatory Network. And uh, we're very, very new. So uh, Gleon was funded about eight years, nine years ago uh, with a, a mission of understand, predict, and communicate the role and response of lakes in a changing global environment. And the main driver for uh, founding this group was the recognition that many lakes have lake buoys or are starting to have lake buoys with uh, continuous sensor measurements. And so these kinds of data were supposed to be the foundation for the research that this group wanted to do. So it's an international community of scientists, educators, policymakers, and citizens that are interested in lake science. And uh, they really early on started with developing sort of guidelines and policies. And uh, so now it is a group that has built a lot of trust. And they really try to implement open data sharing but the technology is not quite there for this open data access. And this is what we're trying to implement here with the Data One uh, software stack. So this year we have our 16th meeting. It is mostly, the, the group works together mostly through working groups at these meetings, at these annual meetings. We have 400 individual members. Uh, um, 40 site members, so 
not every individual is at a site and not every site has really individual members, but this is the distribution here over the world. Currently we have 84 lake buoys registered within Glion, and each lake buoy produces data streams from up to 35, 40 sensors, which all can come at a frequency of about a minute measurements. So we're talking a lot of data. What we're seeing uh, our role, or not our role, what we're hoping Data One will provide to this group is uh, dealing with actually the data, the value added data sets. So not necessarily these huge, num huge amount of streaming data which come at every minute, but what has happened because these uh, streaming data were not easily accessible, people have gone ahead and have collected these data from different sites, have harmonized them, have put a lot of effort into coming up with a really good research data set of, on which now several publications are based. And these people that have put all that effort into the data sets want the opportunity to publish the data set, have a decidable unit with a DOI, and only then will they really kind of release this data set publicly. And that is where we see our main collaboration with Data One beyond using the Data One software stack, trying it out, testing it out, and hopefully having it accepted by the Gleon community as their data repository. I just want to say a disclaimer up front that I am not an ecologist, so if you have ecological-based questions, you'll have to uh, refer to somebody else. Uh, let's see. So the long-term ecological research network was uh, put in place by the National Science Foundation in 1980. This means we have approaching 35 years of research, but many of the research sites itself have data going back over 100 years. Now I'm going to coalesce or, uh, the vision and mission of the LTER into a single sentence. I'm going to read it here and quote, to better understand ecosystems and their impact to our nation's well-being and the well-being of our planet. And I just want to follow on with another quote um, from Bob Wade is that uh, the purpose of the long-term studies is because some of the most interesting and important ecological phenomena take place over long periods. Long-term observations or experiments are necessary to really and truly understand their impact to society. We have 25 active research sites today as depicted in the map here on your left, uh, 29 total research sites since the beginning of LTER. There are five primary uh, research themes of LTER that were somewhat uh, uh, to keep the sites focused. The first theme is the pattern and control of primary production. Next is the movement of organic matter followed by the movement of inorganic matter, study of disturbance patterns such as fire and flooding, and then the spatial and temporal dis distribution, uh, it's just covered up under there a little bit, of, um, let's see. Ah, again, <laughs> but looking at basically the trophic structure and the distribution patterns over time and space. And those are the primary uh, research areas of LTER. I'm going to transition here into the metrics of the LTER uh, member node. LTER itself focuses on what we consider to be data packages. Uh, the data package itself is a combination of both metadata and data. LTER standardized on the ecological metadata language in the early 2000s. Uh, and then the data itself, although the, the heterogeneity of ecological data is vast, um, but the type of data that we work with are mostly tabular-based data, uh, but we also have geospatial raster, geospatial vector, uh, video and imagery, and different types of audio type data that uh, go along into these data packages. And then just a little bit about the member node statistics. Um, we are using the Metacat as a member node to date. Um, so we, we started operation in 2012. Uh, we were a, one of the founding member node um, within Data One. We have 6,750 unique data packages within Data One today for a total of 45,000 data packages, uh, or I should say objects itself. 
Now, the, the interesting part of this is the data to metadata ratio is very, very low at this point, and that's no reflection on MetaCat, but rather kind of the legacy data management practices within LTER, which we're actually presently changing as we transition to what we'll be using is the, uh, a new data repository within the LTER program called PASTA. We'll be using a generic member node implementation, uh, working with uh, Roger Dahl on developing that. That'll be released in August of 2014, so just uh, next month. We're just doing some final testing at this point in time. Once we move into the, the PASTA GMN member node, we'll have roughly about 4,200 unique data packages, slight difference uh, in the present um, MetaCat instance. We're still lacking two sites within the, the present uh, PASTA implementation. Uh, Right now we have, and I'm, right now this is what we have within PASTA. We went into production in January 2013 with that repository. We have uh, 6,200 total data packages within PASTA. We'll improve that data to metadata ratio to almost 2.0. So with PASTA we have a criteria that there has to be data associated with that data package so that that data persists into the future. We also hope and working, we're working towards releasing over 15,000 Ecotrends data packages into the member node itself, and we'll be uploading another 10,000 Landsat data packages that cover all the LTER sites. So those should be available within, hopefully by the end of this year, within the PASTA GMN. Our partnership with DataOne, uh, some of the benefits here. Uh, we look at the data replication and the persistence of data. We, that is probably the highest priority that we see within the LTR member node itself. It's a trusted infrastructure, and uh, I know this for a fact because I work with the Data One team through the CCIT, and I know they're doing a great job within the infrastructure. It provides LTR a broader exposure of LTR data products to a much uh, larger community, so we hope to actually get those data products out to a global environment, a global community in that sense. And then we're really looking forward to the data tools that are, are going to be um, coming on, online here fairly soon. The semantic uh, discovery and search, the provenance services, and the ability to slice and dice data. And then from the investigator's toolkit perspective, uh, those tools that will be embedded in a number of the other um, products. Why is LTR important to Data One? We have over 100 years of ecological, a broad spectrum of ecological data that we can provide out to this broader community. We have active ongoing research and data collection to date. Uh, we have strong community support and involvement, not only within the uh, information management community in the LTER, but the scientists are involved in the infrastructure and the, the collection of data. And just uh, by the way, the uh, LTR information management will be having their yearly meeting here at the ESIP meeting on Tuesday. Uh, and then again, that we are a founding member of the Data One system. Future happenings that the new PASTA GMN uh, will have guaranteed data availability as part of that member node now, and that'll be released, as I said, uh, in just another month. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk to NPN today for Alyssa Rose Martin. She's the IT coordinator for the USA National Phenology Network, and she can't be here today. But um, there we go. Uh, the USA NPN is a coalition of data partners. You can, as an individual, collect data. You can be working with the research project and collect data and provide it to the NPN data repository. And uh, there's mobile apps, web apps. The thing I think is pretty cool is this Nature's Notebook. If you Google uh, NPN Nature's Notebook, you can collect data in your backyard and submit it to NPN, and you've got um, broad coverage of ecological data. Another good thing about NPN is um, they've standardized the protocols, so uh, you don't have as much loosey-goosey metadata out there. Right now they have 128 data partners. This is individuals and uh, small groups and 3,500 individual observers. The way they set up their data that's in the uh, Data One member node, they have five annual data sets and then at the end of each year they append the most recent year's data onto the end of the data set. So uh, right now they have 
over 3 million records. And if you look at uh, the searches and discovery of NPN data through Data One so far, they've had 316 data reads, which is pretty cool. I mean, once people become aware that this data is out there, they'll spread the word. And uh, using One Mercury with Data One, there'll be more and more discovery. Okay, here's another uh, how we benefit each other slide. Um, the NPN is a PPSR type outfit. It's public participation in scientific research. And that's another example of individuals uh, participating in citizen science. Um, NPN benefits by participating in Data One through the PPSR and EBA working groups. Um, also, the increased visibility of their data. And they are looking at, um, through Preservation of data, it benefits their data sustainability plan. Data One benefits uh, by having more data out there. And um, because NPN has been involved with Data One for a while, they provide feedback to the Data One team. And right now they're a Tier One member node, but they plan to advance uh, up through the tiers and maybe eventually be um, uh, a preservation target. Are there any questions about these or other member nodes? Oh, okay. So, if number of new speakers is back up, just by Yeah. Bill? Bill, would you mind also? And on that side so that uh, <laughs> there's the remote. You yeah. Can see. Okay. Um, just a, a brief summary for the, the member node overview in the lightning talks. We had several, uh, seven, oh, seven <laughs> current and nearly their member nodes talk today. And last year at the DUG, we had seven member nodes and prospective member nodes talk. And so you can see just from these seven today, we cover a wide variety of um, data formats, data types, uh, we cover ecological data, social science data. And I think when you look at all the Data One member nodes together, um, we've got pretty broad coverage and we can look across fields and uh, do some really good science. So are there any questions? Yes. Okay. Chris, I'm going to repeat the question first so that they can hear. I'm actually going to pass this on to Bill. Okay. <laughs> okay. So repeating the question first, um, it was about other ocean uh, networks and whether there are official efforts to recruit them to also be involved. So efforts to in involve the 10 other associations uh, as far as ocean networks go. Um, Bill, or whomever can answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't think there's any real um, official efforts. Um, we, I mean, we're engaging with um, groups like um, NODC and others um, to try and improve general access to um, related information. But uh, you raise a good point in that um, there's a wealth of data that's out there and being well managed and curated that uh, would be highly beneficial to to Data One and all the users of the Data One system. So 
I think um, it'll be worthwhile having some further discussion to see how we can move forward with that. So just to add on to that, um, uh, Data One is working with the OpenDAP community to uh, enable. Uh, so you know James Gallagher, who's the, uh, uh, heading up the OpenDAP uh, software development effort, uh, they're they're making uh, you know all of the various OpenDAP servers uh, be able to talk at the the Data One API. And we know that you know a lot of the ocean observing systems are using OpenDAP to share their data, and so I think that's the tie-in right there, where you know um, once once they make that that software stable and available in the Hyrax and the Thread servers and and the like, then I think it will be available to the it will basically basically be an upgrade for most of the ocean observing systems if they're using OpenDAP, and then they would be able to fairly easily share data through Data One. This question was about uh, discoverability and use of schema.org or other mechanisms for improving discoverability. Um, you know, I, as far as, uh, are you asking if we should be, if, or if Data One is publishing the, the schemas to schema.org that we, that we use? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good suggestion. We probably ought to uh, publish the effectively the data one type schema, which are the low level types of of uh, data objects and and metadata, system metadata and the like that we that we collect. That's the the information that um, is provided by all member nodes and the coordinating nodes. Um, I think that that would be a good idea to publish that to schema.org. Um, and then as far as uh, Providing RDFA uh, within our our content, another good suggestion, I would say. So, yeah. Anything to add, Dave? Yeah. Um, I just add that uh, um, we're already sort of producing RDFA in some of the search results, uh, particularly from the one Mercury search interface. Um, how do you think? No. Well, it could be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We are sort of through microformats approach, um, and we also are producing the the resource map, the uh, open archives initiatives, um, object reuse and embedding format for describing data packages, um, and I think that's registered with um, schema.org, but I'm not positive, so we'll have to verify. But that, we're definitely heading in that direction. So my question is to Bill. I'd like to know how do you see international collaboration in the phase two of data one? So, um, 
So I, I think phase two will be clearly a, a broader focus on not only national but international repositories as well. A lot of the uh, solutions we'll be developing, those generic architecture solutions, are ones that we've gotten feedback from from lots of international collaborators saying as soon as you implement this particular architecture, that is going to make it easiest, easier for us to join in. So that's one of the key goals is to really expand in phase two and we'll be up uh, uh, presumably by the end of where our goal is uh, by the end of phase two, the end of 10 years of data one is to be up there 100 plus in terms of the numbers of repositories. And I would argue that if we are successful, which I think we will be in terms of implementing those generic solutions, we'll be up in the hundreds of our repositories that we provide access to data worldwide. The trick is, I think, is we're all starting to realize is you get to some point and then you reach a critical mass in terms of the data that you're able to point to or the metadata. And that's where we're rapidly heading towards through these uh, new uh, architectures that we're heading in through data one. So yes, we will be uh, doing a lot more international uh, collaboration, lots more meetings, lots more phone calls, lots more web interactions with uh, other partners in Brazil, South America, Europe, and, and elsewhere as well. Uh, so in fact, I'm getting ready to head over to China very soon to initiate some discussions over there with uh, some of our partners in, in that part of the world as well. So. We have a few minutes left if there are other questions. Okay. Um, okay. Well, thank you to all of our member node speakers and uh, to Laura for moderating that one. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, next on the agenda, we have a little bit of a break, um, which will be a slightly longer break now, uh, about 15 minutes or so. And then we go to the breakout sessions. Um, so, again, these are by choice. You go where you would like to go. Uh, we have Big Born B and C, which are this room and the room next door, and then Hasty's, which is downstairs. Do we know exactly where it is downstairs? Just down the steps. That the steps over that way, right? Okay. Um, so that's our uh, remaining schedule for for uh, the next couple of sessions. Um, any follow-up questions, comments at this point? Before we break? We good? Okay. Break. <laughs> <laughs>